I'm Timothy Frigid Morgan of The Next Platform, and I'm here at Club Sportifa in Silicon Valley, surrounded by these beautiful high-performance driving machines. As I'm fond of telling my wife and children, there's a law against speeding, but there is not a law against acceleration. And that's especially true when I'm driving my Dodge Challenger, which has a very respectable 375 horsepower engine in it. But it's nothing compared to this Ferrari Spider and the rest of these machines here. I thought Club Sportifa was a perfect venue to talk about accelerated computing in the data center and at the edge. And in particular, talking about Intel's fourth generation Xeon scalable processors and the myriad super server designs from Supermicro that can be combined to create lean, mean computing machines. And with that, let's talk about acceleration in the data center and at the edge. Let's start by having introductions. Uh, Ronak, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm Ronak, I'm a senior fellow at Intel. I helped drive our Xeon strategy, our Xeon roadmap. I've spent 25 plus years now at Intel, which is incredible to think about. Most of my time in CPU processor architecture, helping define a whole set of generations of our CPUs. So I love to talk about what we're doing and how it helps our customers. All right, and Vic? So I'm Vic Maliala. Um, I am managing the pre-sales engineering or the field applications engineering for Supermicro and BizDev. Um, the good part about uh, my role is that I get to talk to people like yourself and uh, all the technology partners and the customers. Very good, thanks. So Ronak, uh, there has been acceleration put up and down the hardware stack. We've got it in the cores, we've got it on the package, we've got it sometimes in the chipset, sometimes in a PCI card. You know, it's, it's all over the place. What's, what's driving the acceleration? Why are we accelerating things instead of just computing on cores? Yeah, I mean, obviously the heart of what we do is around general purpose computing on the cores. And so the, the question you're asking is something that comes up. What is the purpose of acceleration? Why do you need special purpose acceleration? And it's really about where are the cycles being spent? How valuable is it to accelerate those cycles with a step function that's really not possible or is much more expensive to do inside the general purpose core in many cases. So because of that, you end up with different accelerators in different places. Sometimes we embed special purpose hardware inside the cores. We've done that for things like cryptography and AES. Now we've done it with our AMX engine for AI. So there's a need for accelerators at each level of the stack, essentially, depending on what your use case is and what you're trying to solve. So there's kind of an alphabet soup of, of these accelerators. And I really want to get a just a short list of what do they do and what do they accelerate? The first one you'll hear us talk about is for AI acceleration, what we call our AMX or advanced matrix extensions. These you program as traditional instruction set uh, capabilities like you've always done with x86, right? And so it becomes easy to use, uh, but it provides a step function improvement because the heart of most of these AI algorithms is matrix multiplication. And now we've built a matrix multiplication engine in every core that you get, starting with Sapphire Rapids going forward, right? So we're gonna build upon that capability over time. But since we believe AI infuses every workload, we want the ability that every workload that's running on your CPU can take, benef take the benefit of AI acceleration. So then you look at, we have our quick assist technology, what we call QAT. QAT is something that we have done for multiple generations as a discrete card typically in our network and telco kind of space for customers looking for encryption and compression capabilities, particularly with data coming in over the network. But it can be used for anybody using those kind of use cases. What we've seen with the discrete part was an uptake that was interesting enough where we said, you know what, let's pull that in now into the Xeon, make that available to everybody because we see use cases where for instance, people are doing database backups using QAT. We have other use cases, again, compression and encryption are everywhere. How do we take advantage of that? Then we have our DSA, our okay. data streaming accelerator. The way to think of this is it's a data movement engine. Moving data is another one of those fundamental capabilities that essentially every workload is doing. Am I copying large amounts of memory from one place to another as an example? Why do I need to have these big powerful cores spending their time copying data from place to place? Instead, offload that, free up the cores for doing the work the cores are good at. That's right. And so you're gonna see these data movement, data moving engines becoming ubiquitous in the industry pretty quickly is the sense I get. We're already there with DSA. We have 
uh, what we call IAA, our analytics engine. And this is really tied to taking a look at databases. I know you love databases. Take a look at databases and what are the primary algorithms that they have that we can accelerate? Things like scanning and filtering. And lo and behold, databases are all about big data. Especially these in-memory databases, the value of them is how much data can you get inside your DRAM? Mm -hmm. The more data I can get, the more valuable it is to me. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna compress the data. That's right. So along with these functions, we've built a compression engine. Now you may say, why do I need two compression engines? I thought you just said I have one with QAT. Why do I need another one with One's IAA? in memory, one's not. Well, one's a, you know, QAT comes from the lineage of, of coming across the network. Then you have what we have with IAA. It's about coming in on memory. So you got it exactly right. But there, there are workloads and algorithms that want even more than that. And so we have a version of Sapphire Rapids, our Xeon Max line, where we've now embedded high bandwidth memory into the CPU. You can get up to 64 gigabytes of this high bandwidth memory with over a terabyte per second of bandwidth, a terabyte. Mm -hmm. right? So imagine how much bandwidth you now have on that. So you see, again, for those workloads that are bandwidth bound, significant speed ups. All right, give me the rapid fire. Uh, rattle off the accelerators and the workloads that they accelerate. You know, it'll almost be easier for me to tell you which workloads are not accelerated because again, the vision here is we want to cover the broad span of workloads. So is it HPC? The answer is yes, with things like HPM. Is it every workload that's infused with AI, which we believe will be every workload? Yes, with AMX. Will it be databases with IAA, which we talked about earlier? Yes, it will be those. Will it be 5G? We didn't even talk about our dedicated 5G acceleration that comes with every core now. Yes. Will it be on the traditional network side with QAT? Data coming in over the wire, I'm gonna compress it and, and encrypt it, yes. Is it going to be, uh, you know, what other classes of workloads do I even need to cover at that point? We've covered the broad span, I think, of essentially every workload you have can be targeted with one of the capabilities we now have. Or multiple. Or multiple of those. Because think about, I'm building a database as an example, because again, I know you love databases. I'm gonna have that compression piece to it. I, I need to encrypt my data now in a database, right? I'm gonna have those analytic functions. And you know what, when I do those analytics, I probably wanna have a little bit of an AI engine running on that data as well to figure out what else can I learn about it? Build a little model around that and, and do some predictive analysis, right? So you can actually stitch together these accelerators just like you're talking about for those workloads. So okay. when you talk about which workloads are accelerated by Sapphire Rapids, it's your workload. And Vic, you obviously are talking to customers and you are not only getting processors and other components and going through the super micro systems to reach the customers, but you're getting demands from the customers going back up. What I want to understand the demand side of this. I got the supply side, but what are customers asking for when it comes to acceleration? I think uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that uh, people are seeing now is, of course, virtualization and more number of cores and everything is there already, right? now. How do they basically use these systems in a standard operating environment where uh, they can pack more punch to that box to start with, but at the same time, uh, within the same uh, power profile, which is which, within the same operating conditions, how do they take advantage of all these things? That's one problem that they have. Second is, um, uh, if you take a look at the applications, now it's not a single purpose box anymore. People are running different applications on the same box in a virtualized environment, or if it's a dedicated type of box, it's a specific uh, application that they are running and they expect it to be running the fastest that they can within the same power budget and everything. So now, uh, if you now start looking at uh, the kind of verticals where uh, people are going to be adopting in, that becomes very quickly a complex equation. So that's what uh, excites us because it gives us an opportunity to differentiate ourselves from others. So bringing all the latest and greatest uh, from let's say Intel, what they have to offer, whether it is the computer, the storage or the networking, whatever it may be, and packing into the system and working with ISVs to qualify those systems into that and making it a uh, right size for the customers to adopt it from uh, Supermicro's perspective, that way they get to get the best of everything that uh, you know we can offer for them. Is this more of an engineering challenge than than you've had in the past because it is more complicated? Oh, absolutely, but at the same time, that's why you know we are here, right? It, you know, it, it it is definitely getting more complex for two reasons. Number one. Um, I mean, Ronak, for example, is driving all these, uh, you know, technical, uh, you know, let's say, specifications, and then making it happen in the complex silicon. Uh, but how do customers know, you know, how to use them? 
And uh, from our point of view, when you take a look at it, okay, all these features are coming in, what form factor that we need to pack it in, and which features that we enable for what vertical. And the adoption of the software stack for these accelerators is evolving. Well, Open source. The software, the software is the most critical piece, right? right? In some cases, you want to make it as seamless as possible, right? So that a customer just upgrades to the next processor and they get the benefit. You take something like we, what we did with Sapphire Rapids where we embedded the HBM, the high bandwidth memory in there, that should just work for people's applications. You get that to the higher bandwidth, as long as you can fit inside that capacity, it's great. You have something like AMX with the AI that I talked about earlier. And we made sure that we had TensorFlow and PyTorch and all the other frameworks ready at the time that we launched Sapphire Rapids. So any customers using those frameworks, it was easy to adopt. But there is going to be a challenge as with the new accelerators, you have to get the next generation of databases to use them, the next generation of other key software applications to update to take advantage of those. Or if customers are developing their own software, how do I use the libraries that we're going to put out there? So we're obviously very committed to making sure that all the right software pieces are available to our customers so that they can build around those. Yeah. So let's, you know, relational database or data store, it doesn't matter. Talk about what's the accelerator that's new with Sapphire Rapids and what's the system that it should be paired with. We're doing yeah. pairings here. Yeah, so, you know, first of all, when you talk about databases and which accelerator, what you're really referring to, just so everybody knows, is that with Sapphire Rapids, we do have a new set of what I'll call dedicated accelerators that are on the SOC. They're not inside the cores. You program them like a traditional PCIe device, so the programming model is well known. And with those accelerators, we have, for instance, our IAA accelerator, our analytics accelerator. And that contains functions that are common in databases like scanning. It also contains things like compression. And obviously, as we have larger and larger data sets, compression is everywhere in anything we do with computing. Right? So you can see that we're working with some of the key open source databases to start and embedding this technology to show the benefit we get with these new accelerators like an IAA. We have other cases where, for instance, our Quick Assist technology, where we've had multiple generations of a discrete accelerator, we've pulled that into the CPU for the first time with Sapphire Rapids. And we have some database customers that are saying, hey, we like the compression and encryption that that comes with, and we're gonna take advantage of that. So depending on the use case, depending on the customer, we have different options for them to take advantage of. The QAT one's nice because they could start even before Sapphire Rapids and take advantage of that if they were using the discrete accelerator. And now it just seamlessly works as they move on, as we move that accelerator on board. All right, and now let's talk about the platform because you know I am the next platform, uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I care about that. <clears throat> so if you take a look at like, you know, one of the biggest reasons why people were choosing like an eight socket, for example, is like they could get huge memory footprint where they could load all these applications and then um, do the queries, you know, the whole idea is how many queries can you do, how quickly the query can be responded to and whatnot. And um, now uh, the way things are, like, you know, the memory is faster. Like you're talking about 4,800 40, megahertz uh, in a one DIM per channel and then 44 for a two DIM per channel design. And um, if you were to go for a four socket, so our multiprocessor systems that, you know, based on the Intel Sapphire Rapids is the great example for that, where you can have a huge memory footprint and you can have queries done very quickly. And given the fact that uh, the uh, the memory usage is much better because of the compression and whatever happens because of the accelerators, that helps the customers to fit more into that same footprint. So I think our multiprocessor is obviously one great example. But at the same time, if you were to take a look at even the storage platforms, we have the petascale storage That was my next platforms. question, so you're jumping. I'm like, <laughs> the reason I'm saying is like, you know, once you miss that, well, where next? I mean, you need to have a very, very high performance flash array. And that's where I think, uh, again, Intel comes into picture because we have PCIe Gen 5 as a part of it. Now we're talking about 80 lanes of PCI Express per CPU. So we have like, you know, whether E1S or E3S or, you know, U.2, whatever you name it, we can support in these platforms. Now we have a very big memory footprint and you have an NVMe and you have a fast I.O. coming from that. And with the accelerators kind of handling how the data need to be moved around within this, inside the processor, within the network, and within the main memory and the cache, that is the one that's going to bring the major advantage for the customers. Yeah, and I think you touched on a couple of good points. You know, first of all, with the new technologies on Sapphire Rapids, you have the DDR5, so you have the, fa the faster memory, like you said. You have the faster I.O. with PCIe Gen 5. You want to make sure that you're marrying your compute to these interfaces, right. right? And so now we have not just more cores, but we have the dedicated accelerators around that. 
and then using those co those accelerators to free up the cores to do more valuable work so that you know something like a compression engine can take care of that your cores you can now use for doing more of your and that's the math software. everybody needs to be doing now right. that's then that's as far as i'm concerned that's the new bid how many cores effective is using the accelerator how many does it free up and and you know what will that do for software licensing mm -hmm. if if you look at even the most complex uh, configuration that we have to offer on the compute only when you compare to the software licenses that's nothing right literally and um, you want the application to be running as fast as possible some are like uh, heavily uh, multi threaded and most of these uh, eda for example you know one of the examples where um, the per core frequency and the performance of the core becomes an important factor. So in which case, I mean, we have a case where we can reduce the number of uh, you know, cores and increase the frequency to stay within the same profile and be able to run this application much faster. So the savings that come from that, it actually shaves off a whole bunch of licensing costs. So ultimately the customer point of view, it's not the CPU cost, it's not the system cost, but the overall solution cost that matters. And the opportunity cost. If it takes like, let's say 24 hours to run a job, if you can reduce it down to like 16 hours, that's humongous. And the, the area they take on the die is nominal. I mean, it's it's really not oh, yeah. very much. The that's cost right. of them is nominal. That's right. Uh, they're essentially free. Right, and then, you know, there are two ways to look at it, right? If you were to like take a look at a platform like this, where it's a hyper platform in a one U or a two U form factor, you have enough I/O expansion, like you know six or eight, or depending on you know what other type of things you are connecting to that. But when you take a look at a small form factor like this, you want to leave as much of I/O space to do something else that is you know kind of critical for your business. So as much of that functionality can be sucked into the processor and accelerate then you are actually bringing the value to customers uh, and you know, efficiency is the cost and uh, the scale. Now we are able to do more. All right, so we've got two machines in front of us. Let's walk through the scenario. That's a storage box, that's an edge box. What's the, what's the use case and the, and the hardware and, and, and how's it being accelerated for that particular workload and, and, and then walk me through this one too. Sure, if you take a look at this box, right? This is our petascale storage. So as a petascale means, you know, this is supporting the E3.S uh, type of storage, and uh, we can easily scale to a very large scale uh, high performance flash arrays in that. And it's supporting like a dual socket, uh, you know, Intel. It can, you can go all the way to the HBM SKU if need be. So think of like, you know, if you have a looking, if you have a requirement for a database type of a system, then you can use the accelerators that come along with Intel within that for the databases. Or if you're looking for a high performance storage where you want to be able to get the maximum performance, whether the data is encrypted, whether the data is secure, and you know, that is what is going to be given and how do you accelerate while you do that, right? So that is the platform that, you know, you could, you know, standard compute. The same thing can actually be used for high performance, uh, you know, uh, compute when the storage is not necessarily being used, given the maximum number of course that it can support within the platform. And that's where, again, you need the balance with something like this on the storage side, well, all that memory, you have the PCIe Gen 5 for the higher bandwidth on the I.O. side, and then marrying that with the DDR5 with the higher bandwidth on the memory side, and then having the accelerators that are tied to really what's that bandwidth across both of those interfaces. Exactly. And then if you were to switch to the box here, this is uh, for the edge. So one of the things that we have seen is that the telco, certain part of the application and the edge, these kind of merging, and people need much higher performance than what they could get from a typical, you know, so-called embedded or uh, embedded processor. ZND ain't cutting it no more. And ZND cuts it for certain uh, applications, but you know you want a lot more pack, you know, a lot more power to that. So what we have seen here is it supports a single socket, uh, you know, Sapphire Rapids uh, SKU in this one. And the best part about this is this also supports, uh, like if you want to use like, you know, any kind of a uh, VRAN or ORAN type of application, the accelerators are already there and we can actually support them in these systems. And the cool thing about this particular platform is that um, this you can actually mount in one of uh, you know Supermicro's uh, like a, uh, outdoor type of uh, enclosure. It supports IP67 type of enclosure. Um, one can use from you know extended uh, operating temperature range, like a negative 45 or 50, going all the way to like you know pl plus 45 or 50. I don't know the exact number, depending on what processor that we can plug in and what's the enclosure that we will be populating in. But the cool thing about it is people can actually use it in a smart city environment. People can actually use it in, uh, you know, inferencing at the edge, whatever it may be. 
given the accelerators are already there that is supported in this platform, if you are using for telco, you can enable the accelerator. If you are using it for some kind of an inferencing at the edge, you can enable that accelerator. You can uh, use it for uh, you know, specific uh, you know, data throughput for multiple applications in virtualized environment, you could use that. And you so, don't burn a slot to add those functions. Well, exactly. That, yeah, that form factor, I mean, look how constrained that form factor yeah. is. If I don't have to have a se separate card, I now have that inside the CPU, there's value to that as well. And, and, you, and might, the power. you might be able to have a, a higher, a higher uh, uh, thermal yep. CPU with more cores. No, but I think, you know, again, the idea is that there's just a couple of these systems that we put here, but when you start, you know, looking at all this vast product line that Supermicro has to offer to match all the processors yep. and uh, all the accelerators, now you can think about how these things could be used for different, uh, you know, applications that customers yeah, I mean, can be using. From my standpoint, I love to see actual systems and, and look at those two systems. They couldn't look any different, but the building blocks that we're using, especially from the CPU side, are the same. And so we're trying to, again, talk about the span we're covering. This is showing an example of, of exactly what, what we intended to do when we started defining this product many years ago. All right, so I guess uh, for the last question, is this the new normal for how compute is going to be done? I mean, I, I think it is. Yeah, I think you're right. I think our vision, like we talked about a little bit earlier, is that we continue to evolve these over time. We increase their capabilities and we look for the next set. What is the next place we want to give that step function? And does it make sense to increase their capabilities or create a, new, a brand new set depending on whatever that may be? And it's really about how do we stay close with our customers and understand where are they spending their cycles? What are their workloads doing? Where do they want to take their workloads? And how do we provide them with the silicon solutions that give them the performance they need at the efficiency they need? I think from the systems point of view, I'm thinking different ways to look at it. One is um, CPUs are getting hotter and getting more powerful. And as more and more accelerators getting sucked into that, which actually improves the efficiency, and as people need it, they can actually enable them or not. Liquid cooling is going to be, you know, adopted a lot more than what it is now. All right, it sounds like a win. So it's it's going to make everybody's life easier in some ways, which is always a good thing to see in the server business. And Absolutely. it's good to bring value to customers, so why not? Yeah. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have. Should we go for a ride?